You see the premiums in Shanghai at, you know, four or five dollars what they're trading in the COMEX. You know, I think that tells you something, yeah. um, you know, and, and, you know, I think the COMEX players are offside. And, um, and I, I, I think they're, they're probably, you know, whether they're at their financial limits or not, who knows? We're not inside the, <laughs> the banking system in, 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 in any way. But um, it's nice to see that, um, you know, they're not leaning on the price as they historically has. You know, we, we had the NASDAQ hit 5,000 uh, in, in uh, uh, March of 2000. Mm. And uh, uh, over the next two to three years, uh, the NASDAQ dropped 80%. Um, and that was really with the signal for that. All that money had to find a home somewhere. And all that money went into, or not all the money, but a ton of the money went into the mining sector. Some went into real estate and so on. But uh, um, nevertheless, the, uh, so, so, you know, you had silver at $5 an ounce. You had uh, gold at $240 an ounce. And over the next 10 years, you know, you saw silver, uh, gold go up eight times and, you know, silver go up 10 times. And then, uh, uh, I think that's where we are. I think we do need to see some of these big cap stocks, NVIDIA, you know, Apple, Microsoft. Keith Newmeyer begins by acknowledging that his long-standing prediction of $30 silver has finally materialized. He notes that while it's gratifying to see this price level, it's merely a stepping stone towards much higher valuations. Newmeyer has been a vocal advocate for triple-digit silver, and he's now observing a growing belief among investors and industry experts that such a price is achievable. One of the main drivers of this optimism is the fundamental supply-demand imbalance in the silver market. Numai highlights that even conservative estimates from the Silver Institute suggest a consumption level of 1.2 billion ounces in 2024. Some estimates are as high as 1.4 billion ounces. This demand far outstrips the current annual production of around 830 million ounces. The question of where the additional silver will come from remains unanswered but the supply shortfall is beginning to reflect in higher prices. Newmeyer emphasizes that the current price increase has not yet impacted supply in a meaningful way. The reason is that miners require stable, long-term pricing to justify the significant investments needed to boost production. Unfortunately, this stability is lacking, largely due to governmental policies that hinder mining operations. Governments, particularly those pushing for a green revolution, are paradoxically making it increasingly difficult to extract essential metals like silver, copper, and zinc. Neumeyer points out the irony in this situation. While governments promote renewable energy sources like solar panels, which require substantial amounts of silver, they simultaneously impose regulatory hurdles that can take decades to navigate, thereby delaying mine development. This regulatory environment creates a significant challenge for mining companies. Even with promising discoveries, it can take over a decade to bring a new mine into production. During this time, companies must secure financing, navigate bureaucratic obstacles, and manage operational risks, all of which require considerable time and resources. This delay not only impacts the availability of silver, but also contributes to the ongoing supply-demand imbalance. Now we'll show you the best clips of the latest interview. But first hit the like button, smash the subscribe button, and turn on notifications so you do not miss out our daily recaps. Well, I've been predicting $30 silver for a couple of years, so uh, it's nice to be right. <laughs> uh, you know, I've, I've coined the phrase triple-digit silver, you know, a decade ago, and uh, you know, I'm seeing people now starting to believe that is actually a possibility. Um, I think it should have happened a long time ago. In my presentation earlier today on stage, you know, uh, I was talking about the silver fundamentals and just the fact that um, even the Silver Institute's um, suggesting 1.2 billion ounces of consumption mm. in 2024. I've heard numbers as high as 1.4 billion ounces in a market whereby the miners are only producing 830 million mm. ounces a, a year. So, you know, I, 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 you know, where the silver is coming from, who knows, but it is, a, it is showing up in price, which is nice to see finally. And um, you know, I'm still expecting higher metal prices or silver prices. I don't think it has any impact on supply demand. I, I think that, you know, because the miners themselves need long-term pricing to be able to have the confidence uh, in, in making the necessary investments uh, to increase production. Uh, and that's not happening. You know, you also need to see governments also get in line with, you know, um, uh, getting ounces out of the ground, whether it's copper, whether it's silver, whatever metal, zinc, uh, you know, all, all these metals are very, very important in the green revolution. And, the, you know, the governments are pushing solar panels, yet they, they, it takes 20 years to permit a mine. 
So, so you know, if you're a gold company or a silver company, uh, you know, and, and you have a discovery hole, um, um, which we've seen a few in the last year or so, uh, which is exciting to see, and you know, stocks do okay, and so on and so forth, and, um, and investors, you know, make a little bit of money, but that executive team has to finance that asset for the next ten plus years uh, just to get that thing permitted and get ounces out of the ground. As long as the governments don't. Uh, you know, get on, get in line, you know, with their rhetoric, you know, because they're pushing all these, uh, you know, great ideas, green revolution, et cetera, but yet they make it so difficult for the mining sector. So, you know, $30 silver is great. You know, I, you know, we're selling silver at 30 bucks right now, which is, uh, so our margins are looking good. Our profits are, are increasing. But does it affect supply? No, not yet. It's really interesting. Uh, you know, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> really, um, uh, you never know what's going on in the paper markets. You know, the you know the paper market trades two hundred and thirty times the physical market on a, on a daily basis. So that's a like crazy leverage. And I remember back in you know during the Reddit squeeze uh, in. Uh, uh, 2021, I guess it was, um, you know, when silver went from about 18 to 30 in a matter of two days. And, and I remember the, the uh, uh, chairman of the CFTC going, getting on to MSNBC saying, oh, we successfully tapped down the silver price. And I'm going like, what? what what's a regulator care How? about the price? <laughs> yeah. Like, it's not their job to care about price, you know, and uh, I was really quite confused about that. And uh um, so I think there was an effort to suppress the prices back then. It was pretty obvious. Um, uh, this time around, the, the, I think it caught people off guard. And I, I, I just don't think the, the, the energy is not there within the banking sector to continue with those games. I think there, there are you know, people in the sector, the banking sector I'm referring to, that are actually looking at the actual real fundamentals of the metal. And they're realizing that, hey, you know, maybe we shouldn't be holding this price back, uh, you know, as we have historically. And, you know, maybe we should let it go uh, to, to some nat natural price that that's more, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, points at the fundamentals of the metal. You see the premiums in Shanghai, at, you know, four or five dollars what they're trading in the COMEX. You know, I think that tells you something, yeah. um, you know, and, and, you know, I think the COMEX players are offside and, you um, and I, I think they're, they're probably, you know, whether they're at their financial limits or not, who knows? We're not inside the, <laughs> the banking system in, 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 in any way. But um, it's nice to see that, um, you know, they're not leaning on the price as they historically has. You know, it's like any, anything that trades, you know, whether it's a stock or a commodity, it doesn't really matter. But, you know, people get used to a certain price and uh, they, they will buy at a certain price, they sell at a certain price. So I think we need, you know, the metal to stay at $30 for a good couple of quarters. And, uh, you know, we're in the weakest uh, period uh, for the metals. You, you go back and look at 30 year charts. June is always the low uh, for gold and silver. And uh, we've gone out through June and it held up quite nicely through that period of time. And we're now in July, which is the you know depths of the summer, uh, generally pretty low volume period. Uh, you know, metals generally don't don't start to improve until August, September, October. And uh, if, if silver holds up to these prices uh, over the next couple of months, I, I'm expecting $35 by the end of the year. Another factor influencing silver prices is the disproportionate size of the paper market relative to the physical market. Newmeyer discusses the extreme leverage in the silver market, where paper trading volumes can be 230 times the size of the physical market. This disconnect between paper and physical silver creates opportunities for price manipulation. As was evident during the Reddit-driven silver squeeze in 2021, Numai recalls how, during that period, the price of silver surged from $1.18 to $1.30 in just two days. However, this rally was quickly subdued, with the chairman of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission CFTC publicly stating that they had successfully tapped down the silver price. Numai was baffled by this admission, as it suggested an intentional effort to suppress prices, which is outside the regulator's mandate. Despite these historical efforts to keep silver prices low, Neumeyer believes that the current market dynamics have caught the banking sector off guard. He senses a shift in sentiment, with some within the banking industry recognizing the strong fundamentals underpinning silver and questioning the wisdom of continued price suppression. Neumeyer acknowledges that the silver market has traditionally exhibited seasonal patterns, with June typically being the weakest month. However, he points out that silver has held up well through June and July, despite these being low volume periods for the metal. 
if silver prices can maintain their current levels through the summer. Newmeyer expects further gains in the latter half of the year, potentially reaching $35 by year end. You know, it's new. This has just happened. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, you know, um, um, it's, it's, of course, you know, we sold some silver the other day at 31 bucks, and uh, that was obviously quite nice. It's been years since, uh, you know, we sold silver at that price before. But uh, so that's nice to see. But it's going to take some time, you know, um, you know, a couple more quarters. And then, uh, you know, we had, you know, we had a bit of a rough first quarter. We've got two mines that are going through a bit of a transition right now. We had the, uh, Lincoln Tata lose their water last uh, summer. Uh, one of their one of the um, uh, wells collapsed, and uh, we lost thirty percent of the water supply. So you know, I didn't want to lay off the workforce, so we kept running at at, at two thirds of the production. So our, we have high fixed cost, um, um, but less production. So of course that affects your your yeah. your profitability. So now that's re rectified itself. Uh, we found a brand new uh, great looking water well in April. So Lincoln, Lincoln Tad is now back up to 3,000 tons a day, uh, which is nice. So it, but it takes a couple of months to, you know, to actually to see um, um, a bottom line improve there. Sandemus, we're leaving one, uh, a large vein, which called Jessica. We've been mining that for the last five years. Mm -hmm. And we're now leaving that vein, going into new whole vein system. So of course you've got this delay and uh, uh, that takes a couple of quarters. We're just going through that transition now. Um, Q2 numbers are coming out shortly and uh, you know Q2 looks a little bit better than Q1. Um, it's not where I'd like to see it. I, I think by Q3, Q4, uh, we're going to be back on track with our guidance and uh, looking forward to ending the year on a very positive note. You know, I, I look at this time frame very similar to 1999-2000. I've said this before, and, and I, 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 I honestly believe it because, you know, we, we had the Nasdaq hit 5,000 uh, in, in uh, uh, March of 2000. Mm. And uh, uh, over the next two to three years, uh, the Nasdaq dropped 80%. Um, and that was really with the signal for that all that money had to find a home somewhere. And all that money went into, well, not all the money, but a ton of the money went into the mining sector. Some went into real estate and so on, but uh, um, nevertheless, the uh, so so you know you had silver at five dollars an ounce, you had uh, gold at two hundred forty dollars an ounce, and over the next ten years, you know you saw silver uh, uh, gold go up eight times, and you know silver go up ten times, and then. Uh, uh, I think that's where we are. I think we do need to see some of these big cap stocks, NVIDIA, you know, Apple, Microsoft. I think we need to see some of the big money leaving that sector because the pension funds, the big mutual funds, the, the, you know, the, the, the big money is not invested in the mining sector at all. Uh, you know, here we have a retail conference. You know, they, there's a lot of people here that have been investing in this sector for years, much, much of their lives. <clears throat> and then this is kind of the underpinning to the resource sector. But without that institutional shareholder base, it's it's tough for these stocks to really to move in any kind of substantial way. And you look at the GDX and GDXJ and you can see that, you know, just, you know, even though we got $30 silver and $2,400 gold, these stocks haven't really moved a whole heck of a lot. So we really need the institutions back in this market. The recent surge in silver prices is a positive development for First Majestic Silver Corp, as it boosts the company's profit margins. However, Newmeyer cautions that this price increase alone is not enough to spur new supply. The mining industry still faces significant challenges, including the long lead times for mine development and the ongoing regulatory obstacles. Newmeyer likens the current market environment to the period leading up to the early 2000s when the Nasdaq bubble burst, leading to a massive reallocation of capital into the mining sector. He suggests that a similar shift could occur if high-flying tech stocks like Nvidia, Apple, and Microsoft experience a correction. Such a scenario would likely drive institutional investors back into the mining sector, providing the capital needed to unlock new sources of silver supply. On the topic of mergers and acquisitions, Mumai states that while the recent price increase is encouraging, it does not fundamentally change the way First Majestic Silver evaluates potential deals. The company continues to use conservative metal price assumptions, around $25 per ounce of silver, when valuing assets. This conservative approach ensures that any acquisitions remain viable, even if prices were to pull back. Mumai also highlights the company's significant investment in exploration and development. With a $39 million exploration budget and a $65 million development budget for underground projects, First Majestic Silver is well positioned to expand its resource base and increase production in the coming years.
On the M&A front, you know, we're, we're not going to be using $30 to run, you know, long-term, you know, uh, cash flows. Um, uh, we, we will do a sensitivity for sure. So we'll know what it is at 30. But when we do an actual valuation on what we should pay for an asset, we'll lose some, use some lower number. Um, and probably right now we probably use 25, you know, if just for argument's sake uh, on, on a, you know, uh, but, um, you know, it does give us confidence for sure. You know, we, we, you know, we have a huge exploration budget, uh, we're spending $39 million in exploration this year. We've got a big development budget, I think $65 million on, on underground development we're spending. Um, you know, so, you know, historically, when we set our, our guidance and we set our internal uh, budgets, we use metal prices, of course, because we want to figure out how much cash flow we're going to be generating for the upcoming year. And unfortunately, over the last decade, you know, we've always you know, projected too high, you know, me being a bull, you know, we'd be projecting, uh, you know, $25 silver. And then next thing you know, it's trading at 21. And then we have to start canceling exploration projects. We have to, you know, lay off people, you know, we have to just, you know, wind down the business or wind down the investments. So right now, I, you know, at these <laughs> kinds of prices are, are, projections our guidance is actually lower than the current metal prices so we're going to be generating more cash than even what we expected which is always a nice place to be you know but the qp or the qualified person you know who's responsible for that role you know he has to follow a regulatory strict regulatory system so you know with silver at 31 today we're not going to use 31 for no. our reserves, you know, because, you know, it's been too short lived. So what what ten, what they tend to do is use a three year backward average mm -hmm. price. Uh, we measure that against what the banks are saying as well. Mm -hmm. So we'll look at the big banks, BMO, TD and, and so on and uh, see what their long term projections for the metal is. And we'll compare that to and, and we'll even pick up the phone and, our, you know, our CFO will call other CFOs of, you know, CPI, uh, mining companies in our peer group and say, hey, look, what are you going to be using for your, you know, you know, 2025, you know, uh, metal pricing? And we just, I just received an email yesterday from my chief operating officer asking me what I, you know, what I'm thinking. So we're now going through that process for 2025.